Well, if you'll stand with me, please, and open your Bibles to Psalm 20. I would like to welcome you to this second service today and also welcome our Facebook audience that's watching and those who may be watching by some other means. But um, we're going through the book of Psalms here on Sunday morning. Hi, Rachel. Good to see you. Glad to see you. On Wednesday nights, we're in our Through the Bible study, currently in Genesis, and we're averaging about three chapters per week. And so this Wednesday evening, we'll be starting around in the first part of Genesis chapter 15, 16, 17, and maybe 18. And that's kind of the pace we've been at, and you're certainly invited. And also, before we read this psalm, I wanted to, well, I'll pray about this other thing. It'll, it'll be clear to you. Psalm 20, for the choir director, a psalm of David. In times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. May he send you help from his sanctuary and strengthen you from Jerusalem. May he remember all your gifts and look favorably on your burnt offerings, interlude or selah. May he grant your heart's desires and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy when we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of our God. May the Lord answer all your prayers. Now I know that the Lord rescues his anointed king. He will answer him from his holy heaven and rescue him by his great power. Some nations boast of their chariots and horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. Those nations will fall down and collapse, but we will rise up and stand firm. Give victory to our king, O Lord. Answer our cry for help. Let's pray, please. Well, Father, I did want to pray also for the invitation cards that have been handed out to the people here this morning and ask, Lord, that you would put compassion in our hearts, you would put understanding in our hearts that who are the people that we see throughout the week? Where do they stand with God? Are they saved? or are they perishing? Would you give us grace? Would you fill us with a humble boldness, a sincere love to reach out and say something of just a kind word? You're invited. Check out these videos. They'll help you answer your questions. Lord, please make us aware, as never before, of those around us. And now for us, Lord, we pray that you would bless our souls abundantly as we go through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. If you don't, does anyone need a Bible? If you do, please just lift up your hand and uh, the ushers will get you one. Looks like everybody's squared away. This psalm, the psalms are songs. And sometimes we forget that, but they were written as songs. This particular song was written for, it says, the choir director. So David was the author. He gave it to the choir director, who then would lead the people in singing this particular song. And he would do it, he would, he would use this particular song in times of trouble. Now, we don't know the specific time of trouble that is being referenced here, but we do know this, that during the reign of King David, the nation of Israel was const not constantly, but uh, regularly fighting the enemies that had not been destroyed by the invasion into Canaan land by the Israelites. In fact, God had specifically promised to his children that he had apportioned to them 340,000 square miles of territory. 
He gave them the specific boundaries of that land, and they were to go into the land, and that if they would look to him and walk with him, he promised that he would drive out the enemies of the land. And he said, I won't drive them out in one year, because if I did that, the whole land would be just, uh, it would be destroyed. The cities would be destroyed, the crops would be destroyed, the animals. He said, I'm going to drive them out little by little so that there can be order and the land wouldn't suffer too much. And what happened was that initially the children of Israel uh, were quite victorious. You'll remember the Battle of Jericho. And the way that that city was taken, it was taken in such a manner that the soldiers didn't even have to fire or shoot one arrow. The Lord completely gave them that city to teach them a lesson, that it was God who would bring the victory. As long as they trusted in God, they then could possess the land that God had for them. And they could destroy the enemies. We know the next city they went to was a smaller city called Ai. And because of them being uh, flush with victory from Jericho, they said, well, we, we don't need many men. Uh, we can take this city. And they acted in self-confidence. They no longer were trusting in God as they had when they were marching around Jericho for seven days. And consequently, because they were trusting in themselves, they didn't take that city. They lost that battle, and 36 of their soldiers were killed. 36 may not sound like a lot, but one is a lot. 36 men died. Their families were now without a father, without a husband. And so Joshua went back to the Lord, and he began to cry, and he began to ask God, you know, what's happened here? And the Lord began to explain to him that they had misplaced their confidence. They were trusting in themselves and not trusting in him. Well, they began to move along, and they began to take one city after another. But ultimately, instead of taking all 340,000 square miles, which God who cannot lie promised to them, they only took 34,000 square miles, only one-tenth of what was to be given to them. Now, the, the application for us is this. Well, let me, let me back up a bit. So consequently, there were left in the land Philistines, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, etc. These were vulgar, cruel, godless, pagan people who viewed the children of Israel as invaders, and you can certainly understand how they would have believed that, and in one sense they were. And so they would constantly attack the children of Israel. And during the reign of David as the king, he was also a military general. And he would go out and he would defeat the enemy. He was very, very victorious uh, in that regard during his reign. One of the applications for us as Christians today is this, that the Lord has promised you and I and has given to us what are called blessings in Christ. He's promised to give us these. And... It's up to us to actually possess what God has given to us. And that would be called growing in Christ. Growing in Christ involves not only growing in the grace and the knowledge of Christ and drawing closer to him, but it also involves putting down the enemies of our own flesh. Colossians speaks of it as mortifying the flesh putting to death our fleshly members, those parts of our fleshly nature which are still warring with the new person inside. We can gain victory over those things. And if you speak to any mature believer, they've walked with the Lord, they've been serious with the Lord, they've been committed to him, they can account to you how, yes, you know, in my relationship with God, I 
I used to have this problem, but the Lord has helped me, and that's no longer a problem for me. I, no one ever is problem-free, but a Christian can have as much of God as a Christian wants to have and consequently enjoy the, the geography, the spiritual geography, if you will, that God has given to us to enjoy. Sad to say that what happened to the Israelites possessing one-tenth of what they could have, that is often a description of Christians. They remain oftentimes baby Christians, carnal Christians, lukewarm Christians, backslidden Christians. Instead of pressing on, following Christ and being one of his disciples. So this psalm was written by David for the choir director, for the people to be sung during times of battle, and it was to be, it was to be sung to God that he would bring victory to King David as he led the nation. And we, we sing... Um, we sing God Bless America. Uh, oh, now I had it all written down here. Pastor Mike, could you come up and sing it for us? <laughs> this, morning, this morning when I came to church, Mike's always faithfully, as faithful as can be, he and Gil are always in the information center. And I said, Mike, I said, uh, good morning, a little chit-chat. And I said, Would you, could you print out for me the song God Bless America? And he said, which one, you know? And I said, the one, that, and I gave him a little bit of a uh, little line or two. And he said, okay. And I said, now, I'd, I'd like you to sing that this morning. And he, he kind of thought I was kidding. And then I said, no, I'm not kidding. And then he looked at me like, he's serious. <laughs> and I said, I am kidding. But the reason I wanted to have him printed out to me is that this psalm was Israel's national anthem during times of war. We sing, God bless America, it's a prayer, God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above, and it goes on and on. And it, it, whenever Christians sing that, we know there's that spiritual connection. Lord, would you please bless our land? And so this psalm is like it was their national anthem. And it has application to you and I, and we'll see that as we go through it. But in verse 1, it says, In times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. So during these portions of their, their, lively, their, their life there, these portions that were characterized by distress, by anxiety, by difficulties, these were real battles with formidable armies coming against not just Jerusalem at different times, but it out in different areas away from Jerusalem. He's, it, the, the psalm says, may the Lord answer your cry. The word may there is a word that means it's like a hope or a desire or a wish speaking of a certain possibility. It'll surely happen. And might the Lord respond to you? Might he deal with your situation by answering your cry? And the word cry there means the shedding of tears, especially during times of distress and pain. And King David was just a man, but he was anointed by God. But as a man and as the shepherd of Israel, as the king of Israel, uh, he loved his flock. He loved his people. He loved his nation. And when he saw his own men being killed and he saw the destruction, he was crying out to God. Usually generals and colonels and you know, two- and three-star generals never really show their emotions in front of their men, but they'll go off by themselves. And as people with made of clay and just our frames are but dust, they weep. And David would weep to the Lord. And you and I, as part of God's flock, uh, 
we know that he weeps for us. He wept over Jerusalem. He said, oh, Jerusalem, J Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you to me as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. You, you rejected me. And he cried out to God for them. You and I can cry out to God in our times of distress, our times of anxiety. I don't know if you this last week shed a tear or wanted to or wished you could have cried or maybe you were shedding tears inside of your own heart due to some anxiety, some difficulty. I know I had a day and an evening like that the other day. Horrible, horrible times. God helped me to get through it. It wasn't a light-hearted prayer. It didn't, there was no snapping of the fingers and the problem was gone, but there was a, a seeking after God, waiting upon God, and then exercising faith and self-control and bringing my thoughts into captivity. But the people would sing, in times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry, King David. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. Now, whenever you see the phrase, may the name of the, of the God or may the name, there's no magic, there's no power in just the name. There's actually no power just in the name of Jesus. Many people were named Jesus. When the Bible uses the word name, it's speaking of the person. So here in verse 1, in the middle part, it says, may the name of God or the God of Jacob keep you from all harm. So as the people were singing that, they would know, oh yeah, Jacob. Yeah, there was Abram, became Abraham, who had Isaac. He later had a son named Jacob, who later had 12 children, the 12 sons of Israel, and how one of them, Joseph, got thrown into a pit, sold to the Egyptians, and later on, because of famine, they were brought into Egypt and reunited with Joseph, and what they meant for evil, God meant for good. And God had prophesied that the children of Israel would go into a foreign land for 400 years. And at the end of that 400 years, God, through Moses, would bring them out. He rescued them. What a mighty thing for God to rescue three million people who were the slaves in Egypt, and he did it in such a manner that the people couldn't wait for them to go. They would ask the Egyptians, hey, give me money, give me riches, and the Egyptians were all too happy to give them money and uh, cloth, which was considered wealth, uh, you know, it was a, a very wealthy thing to have that. They loaded them up with riches and good and material. Otherwise, how could have in Exodus 25, when they're now in the wilderness, God said, tell the people who want to, to bring to me offerings of silver, gold, and blue, you know, all these materials. They wouldn't have had that as slaves. So how mighty the God of Jacob was. He delivered the people from Israel. He parted the Red Sea. They could have gone into Canaan land, but they through unbelief, wound up wandering, wandering for 40 years in the wilderness. And then finally, under the leadership of Joshua, they went into the, the land, and they possessed only one-tenth of it. But when the people are singing, may the God of Jacob, in their minds, they're remembering, they knew everything in much greater detail than I just told you. They were confident in that God. May the God of Jacob keep you safe, King David, from all harm. And you and I, of course, we worship the same God, and we can have confidence in our God as we pray one for another, as we pray for ourselves. To be kept safe means to be protected or not exposed to danger, not likely to be harmed. And then there in verse 2, the song goes on, may he, the God of Jacob, send you help from his sanctuary and strengthen you from Jerusalem. So requesting now that God would provide help from two different locations, from his sanctuary, 
which is the place where God's visible presence is located. God is, of course, everywhere, but he actually is visible sitting in heaven today. His sanctuary is where he dwells. So, God, there in heaven, in your sanctuary, would you send help? Would you miraculously intervene? and bring help to David? And then would you, from Jerusalem, which was the capital city of Israel during David's rule, would you send help from Jerusalem, reinforcements, intelligence, supplies, just like in any battle, there needs to be a constant supply line of the things that are needed for warfare. Send them help. Send the king help from Jerusalem. Whatever he needs, send it to him. So the song was encouraging the people to look upward to God and believing that God could send help. And we as a church, our church where we live, this is our Jerusalem. This is our home. May God send from our home help to members of our own church body who need help in the most practical of ways. Jiggs came up with an idea the other day, and it's already been being done here and there to, for the men later on to have a, a, a service project to help someone in our body, a widow or an older couple that needs some help at their home, or send help by way of love and care and counsel and wisdom and Bible teaching and forgiveness and and preferring others before ourselves. We're in a battle. We're not the king of Israel, but we're God's children. We're fighting a battle. We need help. None of us can do this on our own. And then in verse 3, it says, May he remember all your gifts and look favorably on your burnt offerings. Now, This is an interesting verse in that it's not as as if God forgets things. In fact, the only thing that God forgets is our sins. He no longer remembers our sins. He chooses never to remember them again. We can't forget them, and we're reminded of them, and the devil knows them. He's got a good... He has not forgotten one sin you've ever committed, and he'll come along at the worst time and say, oh, do you remember that? And we say, oh, yeah, I do. And now we're looking at our past, our sins instead of God. But in the song, God, would you remember all of David's gifts to you? And David was a generous man. In fact, not only did he adhere to the law of Moses, obeying the commands related to giving, but he did something that is called a sacrificial offering, which means that it was, it cost him something. In other words, if, you, if a person had $10 and they gave $1, that's not really a lot. You've got $9 left. But if you have $10 and you gave $9, now that's really costing you something. And so David was that kind of a man that he would sacrifice to God as the Lord led him. And he says, they're saying, Lord, would you remember this man? This is a godly man. And would you remember all of his burnt offerings? This does not mean that he was not a good barbecuer. (laughs) I thought that might help. You know, we need recess for the mind, don't you think? Little moments here and there. I loved recess when I was in the second and third grade. Couldn't wait to get out to the sandbox. Loved it. And I was nice out there, too. I didn't cause trouble. Just, are you interested in more of this information? No, I don't think so. But um, the burnt offerings, you know, there were bread offerings, there were meat offerings, there were all, there was a number of different types of offerings. And each offering had a specific meaning to it. Burnt offerings 
symbolized the offerer's consecration of their life to God, their dedication of their life to God. And the word offerings here is in plural, so you could make that kind of an offering as often as you wanted. And David had regularly consecrated his life to God. And Lord, would you remember this man? He's dedicated his life to you. This is the sweet psalmist of Israel. And of course, in the New Testament, God pleads with us, not commanding us, but pleading with us. In Romans chapter 12, Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. That means to place yourself at the disposal of God. Lord, whatever you want to do in my life or however you want to use my life, I want to be at your disposal. That's the Christian life at its best. There's nothing better than that. That's what holiness is. Holiness is setting our lives apart to God, not only, you know, outwardly, but inwardly in our thoughts and our our will and so on. And God remembers your offerings. You know, he's not unjust that he will forget your labor Hebrews tells us, in that you have ministered and do minister to the saints. God is keeping a record in heaven of who you are and of what you've done so that he can reward you one day. And how nice it is to be able to pray for a friend and say, Lord, you know this man, you know this family, you know this woman how they've loved you and they've given themselves to you. Would you help them? And then in verse 3 at the end, it says in my Bible, interlude, which means interruption or um, intermission, I should say, not interruption, intermission. Yours may say selah, S-E-L-A-H. It means to pause And it's designed in the song to give our minds a chance to catch up with everything that's been said and to really think about what's been said. One of the things in preaching and teaching is to not go at it too hard because people can't, we can't just keep getting information in our heads. There needs to be a a proper rhythm. And there needs to be pauses sometimes so that we can think about what we're hearing. Pastor Chuck Smith was famous for his pauses. If you've ever listened to any of his tapes or CDs. In fact, if you were listening to a tape, sometimes you'd think, the tape must have broke because he would just pause, just waiting upon the Lord and giving the flock a chance to think about it. It also means not only to think about it, but it has the idea of this. So, what do you think about that? What do you think about everything that's just been said? About God and who he is? where he lives, what he can do, what kind of a man David was. What do you think about that? How is it affecting your thoughts right now? So it's nice to take these little say laws, and we can take them throughout the day. You can take them tomorrow and say, well, yeah, what, what do I think about that message? What difference does that message make to me? You know, We can have as much of God as we want to have. Jesus frequently would say, if you have ears to hear, listen. You know, young people can get a doctorate. They can get their masters and their doctorates, which means they have to really listen. So people have the ability to listen. 
Like when my wife says, honey, I know I need to listen. And I try to. But listening to what God says and thinking about what God says, that opens the door for the power of God's word to actually change you. If you are in trouble, if you are in a time of trouble, and, you know, we have, we have so many times of troubles in our lives. We have personal troubles that we go through. We have medical issues we go through. We have employment troubles. We have financial losses, reverses. We have family problems, marital problems, children dynamics, issues in that part of our life. Those are real troubles. In the church, Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. And then in the church, he said, watch out because there are wolves in sheep's clothing that come into the church. Watch out that you don't gossip and slander because it'll divide the church. Be careful to be loving. On and on, there are many, many troubles that we can have. And so we can come and listen to a message and kind of let it just momentarily glance off of our soul. And it, you know, it has a nice effect. But Jesus said, if you listen, I'll be able to give you more help. And I want to help you. I don't want you to just hear and not do. I want you to listen and then put it into application. And that is how we grow in Jesus Christ. So what do you think about that? <laughs> it's really something to think about. It's really at the heart of what happens and what God wants to have happen in the life of a person who has become a Christian. So going on there in verse 4, he says, May he grant you your heart's desires and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy when we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of our God. May the Lord answer all your prayers. So again, the people of God singing this national anthem to God asking that God would grant the heart's desire of King David. David had desires to win. He had desires to keep his people. He had strategized on how to protect Israel and how to deal with that particular battle. May God grant you the desires of your heart. Now in the Psalms, I believe it's Psalm 34 or Psalm 37, God says, and he will give you, is it 37 or 4? He will give you the desires of your heart. 37. He will give you the desires. It's a walking concordance we have here, never mind. God will give you the desires of your heart. Now, that does not mean that just because you want a new car, God's going to give you one. What it does mean is if you're open to God, he will give you the desires that he wants you to have. That's how he leads you. You know, when you're saying, Lord, would you lead me? And I, I want to do your will. And then all of a sudden, because you've submitted your life to him, you begin to have it. You know, I, I think I want to do that. Well, that's a desire that God has given you. And so as David was there, he would have these desires given to him by God, and yet the people were praying, may he grant you the desires of your heart, your heart's desire, and make all of your plans succeed. It's important to have our plans succeed. They will succeed if they're God's plans. It doesn't mean it's easy. But may all of your plans succeed, David. You're here defending our nation. Trust not in your own heart and, and lean not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. He'll, it literally means he'll smooth out the road in front of you. 
And so when God finds a person, the Bible says his eyes go to and fro about the earth to see whose heart is upright before him that he might show himself strong on that person's behalf. So when you are there praying, talking to God in your life, and you're saying, Lord, I want to consecrate my life to you, God says, oh, okay, gotcha. Then let me show you strong. Let me show myself strong on your behalf. Let me strengthen you. You want my will. Good, I'll show you my will. I'll lead you in my will. I want you to succeed in my will, the will of God. Not thy will, but not my will, but thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then in verse 5, speaking of confidence of victory coming, may we shout for joy when we hear of your victory. Do you remember when Osama bin Laden was killed? Hmm? I was in Tokyo eating fish, which I don't like. <laughs> it was terrible. The world was what? Happy, right? The enemy has been killed. It was a shout of victory. People all around, didn't they gather in front of the White House and all of that? And am, am I correct? May we shout for joy when we hear of your victory. Word will come back from the field. It'll come back to Jerusalem. It'll come back to the cities. King David has once again been victorious. And the people would shout because now our families are safe. They're not in danger. They're not going to be overrun by these cruel people. And raise a, a victory banner in the name of our God. And they had literal banners that they would put up and they would wave when our armed forces conquer a place, we plant what? Our flag. It shows that we've gotten victory. And might we shout for joy. May we be rejoicing when God brings victory in a family here, a family uh, that's going to be divorced if they don't get it straightened out. And, and I know people that have been in such trouble and they've sought the Lord and God has brought them victory and every time I see them, I rejoice in my heart with them. God brings victory. And might we pray for victory and might we be glad when we hear that somebody's come back to Christ, somebody's being ministered to, somebody's receiving the word of God. That's a victory. People have rejoiced when you got saved, when children who've gone astray come back to, to their parents. And may the Lord answer all your prayers, David. David was a man of prayer. May the Lord answer all of your prayers. One of the ways to get prayers answered is to pray. <laughs> Pretty simple, isn't it? One of the ways to get prayers answered is to pray. I find prayer in public very easy, with people in a group very easy. Private, closet, quiet time prayer is another matter. It's a learned relationship. We have to learn how to sit down quietly with the Lord, quiet our hearts and come into his presence, and not just rattle off that same prayer, you know, that you've prayed a hundred times, but to speak to God. In the, I'll tell you, that song uh, about the Holy Spirit, that person who wrote that song knew the Lord. You could tell by the language in that, in that song, that person had been at the feet of God because there was something about, uh, you know, when we're close with you, when you move, we are changed. We have tears of joy in our hearts. 
In verse 7, the tone of the song changes now. It's no longer speaking of, uh, specifically of asking what God would do, but rather it's stating what he says, now I know that the Lord rescues his anointed king. So part of this, this praise to God, this song to God is, we know this, that you're the king, David, and God rescues his anointed. It's also a picture of God rescuing the Messiah, raising him from the dead. Chapter 21 of the Psalms is what's called a messianic psalm. And there's little messianic tidbits in this I hate to call it a tidbit, but they're little, you know, mentions of the Lord. You can apply it to Jesus Christ. And I know that the Lord rescues his anointed king. He will answer him from his holy heaven and rescue him by his great power. What confidence to have. Do you have that confidence in prayer? You know, it's, it's a learned confidence. One of the things that helps us to learn is to believe God during the tough times. And that was, again, part of what we sang today. Because if you believe God during the tough times and you keep your eyes on him, you will see the rainbow after the storm. You will develop a confidence in God. It doesn't mean you won't go through trials and things of that nature. You surely will, but we know that you will answer. You're the great God. And then something very, very important here in verse 7 and, and 8 about pride and humility. Some nations boast of their chariots and horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. Those nations will fall down and collapse, but we will rise up and stand firm. And so the people are singing here, we know that there are nations, these nations that were never destroyed, they were boasting in their military might, their armament, their horses, their chariots. But we, the people of God, we're going to boast in, we're going to give glory to the living God. Those nations are going to collapse, but we're going to rise up and stand firm. The Bible says they, those that exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. To rise up and stand firm means solidly in place. We're going to be solidly in place because we're not trusting in ourselves, but we're trusting in God. And then the, the psalm is, closes with a very specific prayer. Verse 9, give victory to our king, O Lord. Answer our cry for help. Regardless of your belief or care of or look how you look at our president, his cabinet, the leadership of our country federally, nationally, 1 Timothy chapter 2 says one of the first orders of business of the church, which is a lost, it's really something that doesn't happen very often, pray for kings and for all who are in authority that we might lead a peaceful and a quiet life in all godliness. Our president, who is the buck stops here, our congressional leaders, the cabinet of the president, these people have the most enormous responsibilities that anybody on earth has trying to govern our nation and to protect our nation and to work with the nations of the world. I, you sometimes, if you, you know, you wonder how in the world can they do it? They need help. Vice President Pence, by the way, is a born-again... You know, there's only one kind of Christian. You know what kind it is? A born-again person. I mean, there's only one kind of Christian. You're either born again or you're not. You're dead in your sins or you're born again. He is a Christian man. Thank God he's there. I don't know the president's faith. He says he's a Christian, and I'm not here to make fun or make a joke of this. This is... 
May, may you answer, may you help our king. Lord, may you help our president. We don't want another 9-11. We don't want to lose soldiers in Afghanistan. We don't want problems like that. We don't want any of that. Help these people. Help our nation. And if you today want to be forgiven of your sins if you know that you are a sinner and you know that you're not saved you should thank God that you've, you've come to that knowledge because you didn't always know that did you but when the Holy Spirit convinces you of it then you know it now you can make an informed decision you can either run to the Savior and I hope you don't do the other only option, which is turn away from what you know is true. You will have a rough go of it, and should you die, you will wind up in hell. But if you run to the Savior, guess what he will do? He will accept you, he will wash you, he will forgive you, he will cleanse you, and you will become born again. You will become a child of God. You'll become a member of his family. And you don't need to raise your hand. You don't need to stand up. You don't need to walk down here. There's nothing wrong with any of that. Right now, as I'm speaking to you, in your own mind, in your own heart, you can say, yes, God, I want to be saved. Now, if you don't really know you need to be saved, don't even pray that because it means nothing. If you know you need to be saved, if you recognize that you don't really have the, that you, you need God to even just awaken you so that you can begin to think about this, ask him to do that. Lord, awaken my conscience. Come to me, show me. But if you're already there, you're not saved yet. You just know the truth. And now it's the time for you to simply place your faith in Jesus Christ who satisfied the justice of God. He died for your sins. Did you know this? That sin, the wages of sin is death. You might ask, well, why couldn't I save myself? Well, you can't save yourself by being a good person. That's clear in the Bible. If you wanted to save yourself, if you wanted to pay for your own sins, do you know what the payment is? <laughs> the payment is physical death and separation from God forever. And there's no way out of hell. So what Jesus did is he came and he was sinless. He went to the cross. He became sin. For he died for the sins of all people, and he was satisfying the justice of God. You believe, don't you, that God is love? Do you? Do you believe God is merciful? Do you believe God is just? Then what must he do with the violations of his law? He must punish them, right? Instead of punishing you, guess who he punished? His own son. You know, I, I, I've been a Christian, what is the date today anyways? The fourth? Yeah, in two more days I'll have been a Christian for 45 years. You know, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can clap for him, not me. <laughs> He's tried to get rid of me for so many years. <laughs> Bob, you're just, uh, you know, bothering me. <laughs> but no, he didn't. But you know, I, honestly, folks, I've taught the Bible for many, 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 many years. For really probably about 43 years. And I, and I really feel like I'm just beginning to 
get a better grip on what Jesus Christ really did. I mean that sincerely. It helped me the other day when I read something by Charles Spurgeon, and he said, God, sat, Jesus satisfied the justice of God. It would, it's something to think about. And I think when you realize, is God just? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What does he have to do then with violation? He can't just dismiss it. He'd be unjust. He, he had to deal with it. And if he dealt with it with you, you would be gone forever. So he said, I don't want that. I want you to be with me forever. So I'm sending a substitute to pay for your sins. All you have to do is accept him because he is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to get to heaven. So I hope, I'm so happy to be able to tell you that today. And may God help us all to grasp the, tr the truth. It's, it's simple, but it's deep. And it's about Jesus Christ, what he's done. So God bless you, and thank you so much.